It's beholden upon us to reflect on our own journeys and change makers. What have we learned? What are we challenged with? How do we get these strategies to be agreed? How do we get the business case built for them? How do we face down challenges as leaders that we come across every day in sustainability? So I'm incredibly excited to have wonderful, wonderful speakers today. And we're going to reflect a little bit on the personal journeys that deliver the corporate strategies. Because until AI takes over the world, which of course is beginning to feel quite close, it's still people who need to make these decisions and make these things happen. So I hope you will join me in welcoming here onto the stage uh, Anne Tracy, Chief Sustainability Officer at Colgate Palmolive, Julia Matthews, Head of ESG at Peloton, and Aman Singh, Director of Global Communications for Sustainability at Walmart. Let's give them some whoops. Whoop, whoop, whoop. They're really nice. We don't have to be intimidated. They're lovely. They're solutions <laughs> house people. And also tag at us somewhere. So if you do see someone jump, it's not because of what we've said. It's because tag at us come up behind them. <laughs> so I'm going to come to each of you and ask you to tell me a little bit about your journey and where you came from. Um, and what, what, what have brought you here today onto this stage from the role that you do and the passions and interests that you have? And, and I'm going to come to you first because Colgate Palmolive is the reason why we're having this session because Anne very kindly decided that this was a topic that she wanted to make sure that Colgate was supporting and this was a conversation that she wanted to make with Shed. So Anne, tell us a little bit about your role and also the incredible journey that you took to, take, to get here. I will, Sully. Thank you very much. And I'm really, really pleased to be here um, with Sully, who I've known for a long time, and thrilled to be here with Julian Aman, who I've worked with over the past several years. So it's wonderful to be here together, knowing each other and our journeys. Um, so a little bit about me. I, um, I've been at Colgate a long time, um, probably longer than some of you are old in the audience. <laughs> I've been there 33 years. Um, and I grew up in the supply chain, um, and that, that's important, and I'll get to that in just a minute. So I worked roles across manufacturing, customer service, and logistics across all our categories all around the world. So I, I, I know everybody at Colgate. I, I, uh, um, you know, it helps now in this position to be able to influence and talk to everyone, because I think empathy and influence is a really key skill that you have to have mm -hmm. in this job, right? Um, and the reason it made sense for Colgate, um, and a lot of the CPG companies are similar, we have been measuring our, um, our energy reduction, our emissions reduction, waste to landfill water since 2002. So for over 20 years, we have baseline data. Um, and that really came from the supply chain. So if there's one function in our company that we really can close to say we've truly embedded sustainability, it's our supply chain. And that's a journey, and we're trying to do that with all functions across the company. Um, and that's very important. And, you know, we have a purpose that we've been, um, you know, every 34,000 Colgate employee lives by now, which is reimagining a healthier future for all people, their pets, and our planet. We all take that to heart. And that serves as a real north star for our sustainability strategy. So about eight years ago now, uh, seven years ago, I came back to headquarters. I was in Europe working there in the supply chain. And I worked with my team and many subject matter experts across the company to develop what we call our sustainability and social impact strategy. We started from a blank sheet of paper and a little plug, Futera helped us build it. Thank you. Um, and we, we focus on three ambition spaces, driving social impact, helping millions of homes, which is about our products, and preserving our environment. So at the time, I became the first chief sustainability officer in the supply chain. And now, about two and a half years ago, I moved over to our team now reports to the head of growth and strategy, which is a testimony, I think, of to how Colgate's thinking about sustainability is part of the growth strategy. And that, a couple of things you said there, I think, will become some themes that we talked about. One is around empathy and being a human being. I was at an event last night where Kate Grant of Google mentioned to me how in this world of AI, 
analytical thinking um, without any emotion is no longer going to become a particularly <laughs> required ability from human beings. We, you know, that, that sort of business decision making without a heart that has been the kind of stereotypical um, decision maker is very easily replaceable by AI and that actually the thing which human beings have that we can bring to our decision making is that heart, that empathy, those relationships that you build up over decades of working somewhere. Right. Collaboration. Right. Collaboration. So Julia, I'm going to come to you. Tell us a little bit about your journey to Peloton, um, which I have recently got and started using. Can you tell? So thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. It you does, look it, happy. It, it does work. <laughs> although, although, I, I, as someone who's an introverted British person, we're like, stop talking to me. <laughs> but um, absolutely wonderful product, inc absolutely breakthrough in the marketplace. How did you come to your journey to, Pel to Peloton? Well, um, thank you so much for having me and thank you for inviting me to join the conversation, Anne. Um, I started my journey at Peloton four and a half years ago. I've had the pleasure of being the first person in this seat of leading the ESG team, which at Peloton includes our environmental sustainability work as well as our social impact work. So our partnerships with nonprofit organizations looking to uh, enhance mental health and physical fitness for the community members they serve. Um, but I'll, I'll go back and then come to the Peloton time. Uh, I started my career as a Teach for America teacher. Oh. I, <laughs> I remember sitting in uh, college in an auditorium and, and oh. listening to Wendy Kopp speak. And I was so compelled by what she shared about the achievement gap in the United States. And uh, for me, that was a very powerful call to action uh, to say, you know, Ultimately, I want to work on something that I think is really important and what could be more important than young people having an opportunity to fulfill their potential. And so I became a middle school teacher. I taught uh, seventh grade and eighth grade English and social studies in the Bronx for a couple of years. I worked for Teach for America, learning about the intersection of nonprofits and uh, the corporate space, and a lot of that learning I take into my work today. Um, and then after business school and some time in management consulting, came back into the education space. And so I would say that a lot of my uh, uh, thinking and uh, approach in the social impact space is really informed by my time uh, working at a nonprofit or at a foundation. I uh, worked for Newark Public schools, so various seats in government and, and NGOs, understanding how all of these players come together in an ecosystem to address the kinds of change that we seek to address as a society. Um, and yeah, I had my own consulting practice and Peloton became a client and it was one of those very fortunate uh, right place, right time kinds of things. And I ended up taking on this role at Peloton uh, with the goal of bringing to life our commitment to become an anti-racist organization. So the first focus of my work was really on our social impact, um, uh, social impact work at Peloton and developing the aspiration there, saying, where are we even going to focus? With whom? Why? What is success? And so I had the opportunity to bring on a team and figure out that strategy. And like I said, we focus on mental health and physical fitness uh, with partners in all of the markets in which we uh, operate. And I got to take on the environmental sustainability piece of our work as well. And, and that was newer for me. And I. I'm so compelled by that work and I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to drive that work. Uh, for me, it's really always been about, well, what is the most important problem in front of us and how do we galvanize all of the resources that we can to think about how do we even name the problem and then how do we articulate our personal um, and our kind of organization's theory of change in service of addressing that issue. And so. Yeah, we uh, at Peloton uh, focus on, from a sustainability perspective, focus on reducing the uh, emissions associated with our products, which is the biggest part of our footprint, and also enhancing the circularity of our products. So programs like our uh, refurbishment program and our rental program are ways that we're able to uh, focus in on that work. Um, and I can tell you more about that in a little while, but. That's how I got to where I am. We will dig into that. And I, I'm very interested in the 
experience of working in public schools and how that helps you manage inside an organization. It's actually the through line is very direct. <laughs> <laughs> next, ne next time we need to get everyone to be quiet before a session starts. I'm going to ask um, no problem. Uh, Julia to help with that. I also Edu have three boys, so don't mess with me. Education is key. <laughs> education is key. And education, this is education on some of these topics which can feel intimidating and overwhelming and scientific and informational and also moral and so people feel really embarrassed that they're going to get the language wrong or they're going to say the wrong thing is so crucial. Now Amal, I know a little bit about your background of course we, we, we have had a little of a bit of shared background at times but I'd love to hear about your story and your journey through your work through your career and to where you are at Walmart now. Thank you, and thank you for having me. And I will say thank you for these comfortable chairs. Mm. Yeah. This is the stuff that matters. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. Um, we, we love our speakers. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I started as a journalist right after college. I was really into kind of the, the power of the pen um, and kind of really using reporting as my tool to make impact. That lasted about two years. Um, felt very frustrated with the pace of change and how much influence I was having as a young reporter. So very quickly moved. Um, 2008 recession was kind of the moment where I was in charge of diversity and inclusion research at a publishing firm and no one was hiring. Mm. Diversity was not a, something anyone was talking about. That's when I started to learn about something called CSR and sustainability. And so the more I uh, dug into it, the more I felt this feels sticky and something everyone is going to have to rally around at some point and it's going to be more meaningful than anything else in our careers. So that, that was kind of how I started. The deeper I got into it, the more motivated I was. I've spent 15 plus years at agencies including Futera. I've learned from some of the best mentors in the space and for the last three years I've been at Walmart. Never thought my first corporate job would be the Fortune 1. It's been, a, it's been a learning curve, but an amazing journey. I feel like I'm learning every single day. And I just keep looking at this quote from Martin Luther King Jr. And it's exactly that in kind of the roles we have. There's a lot of roller coaster rides week over week. But if you can keep the hope, I think the, the light is clear. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Um, so much of your journeys will reflect people who are in the audience, perhaps people who have spent much of their career inside the corporate world, or people who have come from the public sector and education and NGOs, people who have come from journalism and agency world. And there are, of course, many others as well. This is, this is everything. I do not have an interesting journey. I started Futera when I was like 25, and so this is all I've ever done. Um, so yeah, my, 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 my journey is the journey of an entrepreneur, but um, uh, that's a journey where you just have to keep doing entrepreneurship again and again and again. So, I'm going to come to questions to the audience because these are some incredible women able to give insights about your own journeys, your own challenges, the things which you might be facing in terms of influencing up, in terms of influencing across, and in terms of influencing down. And I'll also come to the audience who are online. So if you want to post your questions online, I will see them here by the magic of the internet on my iPad. But what I'd love is let's, let's get specific in terms of things which you've, which you've managed to make happen. Because I think often when we're talking about these things, we can talk at quite a high level, but actually by telling the story of a specific success you've had, something which you managed to get through, maybe we can interrogate what it took to do that and what learnings we have. So Anne, do you have a specific story for us? I hope so, because I asked you in advance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, I will, I'll talk about one, and, and but, but it's not always easy, and I think the audience can all attest to that. Um, but we're all here together with completely different backgrounds, which is fascinating. That's what I love about this space, right? People come from legal, you've said it already, but from all different backgrounds, but we all share a common you know, mission, if you will, to find the solutions to these tough problems. So, and you know, I, let me lead by saying whatever role you have, whether it's Walmart, Peloton, Colgate, to me, one of the keys is focus. You have to find a way to focus because there's so many things to solve out there. So, you know, one of the ways we've done that, we, like I mentioned, we have a, a, a we call them three ambitions, the driving social impact, helping millions of homes and preserving our environment in our strategy. And we have 11 carefully chosen actions that are important to Colgate. So first filter one, focus what, what's important, what's material to us. 
And then beyond that, there's you know, 48 targets, 11 actions, all this uh, work we have to do. Um, we use a metaphor called swords and shields. Yeah. Shields are the things we have to do because compliance, taxes, reputational risk, you name it, we have to do these things. Swords are where we want to lead, how we want to be known, and hopefully where we want to succeed. <laughs> so I want to tell one quick story um, in that realm. We, our, our swords are, we have one for social, one for uh, helping millions of homes, which is our products, and one for um, preserving our environment. For social, it's Bright Smiles, Bright Futures, which is bringing, we, we, we're the world's largest seller of toothpaste. We make half the world's toothpaste. The world uses 20 billion tubes of toothpaste, and half of you brushed your teeth with Colgate this morning, if my statistics are right. Um, so we bring oral health and hygiene to children in underserved communities around the world. Um, under climate, we think we punch above our weight. We were the first uh, consumer goods, multinational consumer goods company to get our net zero targets approved by SBTI. And the one I want to talk about briefly is um, eliminate plastic waste. That's our existential issue. We, all of our products come in plastic. Okay, We're part of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation global commitment, which means we've signed up to making all of our packaging recyclable, getting rid of problematic packaging, and to reduce the amount of virgin plastic that we use. And there's no silver bullets here. Mm. But one of the things we've, you know, we've leaned into first is with so many tubes out there, 20 billion tubes, we wanted all tubes to be recyclable. Because the tubes in general, whether it's toothpaste, uh, I used shampoo to actually, I thought I was using my shampoo as a conditioner. I'm like, why isn't it sudsing up this morning? <laughs> but yeah, there's right. so many things in tubes, right? Yeah. Um, so we decided to start a movement to make tubes recyclable. So back in 2015, this has been a journey. We said the tube had to be made out of a, a plastic, a monomaterial plastic that's readily recyclable. We chose number two, which is your milk jug or your fabric softener bottle plastic, very rigid. It had to protect what's inside and it had to be, feel like a tube to the consumer because consumers don't want to change. Um, so we developed, it took several years and uh, by 2019 we started rolling it out. Then we shared the technology with all other tube manufacturers. This is huge. That's so a big deal. It. Yeah, I mean, tech, the tech and yes. the software. Of course, the lawyers made sure we did that in an in a antitrust way. But so fast forward, uh, four of the major toothpaste manufacturers moved to, the, to HDPE. And we hit our first milestone at the end of 23, 90, 95 or 90 or 95 percent of all toothpaste tubes have been converted now in the U.S. That's huge. Amazing. That is absolutely. And also, yes, that does. That does deserve. And also, in, can I just point out how rarely that happens, and how much it sucks that it doesn't, because you don't get marketplace change. That one company will come up with an innovation, will sit on it, and then will complain why the entire marketplace hasn't changed, and why that they're struggling to get adoption, and why consumers don't like it. It's like going, well, maybe because you didn't let anybody else do the same at the same time. Whereas everybody moving together on that, and then you're in a different position. How hard was it to convince folks inside that you were going to give that away? <laughs> well, to be honest, our CEO made that decision. That's huge. So leading from the top. So, but it takes tremendous collaboration, um, working cross-functionally, you know, tying it back to the different leadership journeys that we came from. It doesn't matter where you came from, but you're going to have to work with every function. Every function in the company had to play a role in that, if you stop to think about it. More to come, because we're just now at the point where we're convincing the material recovery facilities to truly accept it. That, that critical mass was, was mm -hmm. important for that. And then marketing has to help us with consumers. So yeah. we're still on the journey. Great story, and also um, thank you for spontaneous applause. I don't even think that was started by the Futurans. I'm really impressed. <laughs> um, I'm going to Scott. I'm going to come to Aman. You're on the end. Can you tell us your story? Like, what is something which which you'd like to share that you've managed to pull off, which might help inspire others? I don't know that I've managed to pull it off yet. Oh, even um, better. But it's in, in progress. In progress, and I think it's 
it's the vantage point of being in such a large company and, and a company that is intentionally trying to get things right because there's deep awareness that if we can get it right, it can scale with our suppliers, with our NGO partners, with our customers. And so I sit in global communications and I have the advantage of having visibility across the company, yet I support sustainability and energy. So for me, one of my biggest tasks, uh, I think, if I am to be successful, is embedding this in all the other functions. Mm. So while the sustainability and energy teams are doing the hustling on making the business case, case matter, the PL conversations, the supplier engagement, I come in with kind of how do we help the rest of global communications rise to that challenge and ask different questions, pull this into how their job can be successful. So I think one part of that has been we've, we've built a narrative internally where Everything has to ladder up to our purpose, which is helping people save money and live better. At one point, many years ago, it used to be save money or live better. It's now and. And I think it gives us the ability to make sure regeneration, sustainability is built into many more decisions than they were in the past. And so what that means, again, from a communication perspective is connecting the dots with my comms partners on actually how does this help a customer live better or help a community live better, or help a supplier in their goals. Mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, you know, I feel like my titles most days should be chief hustler, because kind of that's what I'm doing. I'm not doing traditional comms, I'm not writing press releases, I'm really trying to influence. And I think that's kind of the in progress. When I start to see my comms partners in merchandising and procurement go on panels, talk to customers without needing me, that's a win for me. That's, it's, one of the things which I found over my career is if you can get someone to stand up on a stage and talk about sustainability, it reinforces their own belief in it. So actually being able to get folks outside of the sustainability community yeah. going and doing that so that they end up with their own networks, their own profile, yeah. their, their, the people that they talk to about sustainability rather than always being the sustainability team. I think that's a really good insight. Like get, give those platforms away. To yeah, folks. I mean, to me, like I feel like we, we say this, Fill up these audiences with non-sustainability people, then we're getting somewhere, right? Yeah, right. yeah. Brilliant. And it's happening because I remember when I started this journey, you know, we do all this work and then we go, the merchandisers just were, all they wanted was quality and cost. But now they're starting to ask. So we have to, we have to also bring our, our sales, we call it customer development team along as well. Yeah. But it's really about instilling confidence and educating them, right? So, right. but so they are the asking, they are yeah, asking. And the sustainability team then becomes the subject matter expert, not the lead. Yeah. So they're here right. to support the merchants, ask the right questions and build it into their conversations for choosing products, but we're not owning it. They get to own it. I get to share. Yeah. That's brilliant, thank you so much. And Julia, coming to you, do you have a story to share with us? Yeah, you know, as you uh, pointed out the education piece I've been sitting here um, processing, you know, what's this connection that I don't know that I fully explored in the past, but I think that um, having been a teacher, is has been such preparation for this work. Those of you who are in the sustainability space, you can probably empathize that so much of it is helping people to understand all of the considerations they need to keep in mind and then work with them to influence them, to get them to think about those considerations. And think back to some of the teachers that have been most memorable in your own education. And I would imagine that in many cases, these are teachers who, uh, they weren't just saying, listen to me because you have to, right? They were thinking about, well, why is this important? And how does this connect to you individually? And they really broke it down and they made it really digestible and clear. And those are really some of the skills that you have to bring in this work. You can't just tell people, do this, you must, the end. They're not gonna listen to you. They're not gonna want to, you know? So it's really about, well, what are we trying to do here? And how does it, help you as an individual accomplish that which you are trying to accomplish? And um, how is it gonna benefit us as a whole? And what does it even mean? You know, So the example that comes to mind for me of a, of a team uh, win for us has been uh, 
our organization's commitment to setting science-based emission reduction targets. Uh, those of you who are familiar with Peloton may know that we've been through a bumpy time since COVID. There's been a lot going on. And, and so there's been a lot of focus on just, you know, keeping things going smoothly. And so to say on top of that, let's commit to these ambitious uh, emissions reduction goals would, for some might say, why, why are you doing that? Focus on, on other aspects of the business. Uh, but the way we, we thought about it was, hey, we, we need to do this for a variety of reasons. And so we really mapped out, well, who are the stakeholders who have a say in this decision? And what does each of those stakeholders care about? And how might we speak to each person so that they can understand why this is important for the objectives that they hold. And so with our CFO, we really emphasize this is something that our investors ask us about. We submit to CDP. It's a question. We, we need this information. For our head of strategy, we talked about how, hey, you know, you can't pursue an objective unless you have clarity on what you're after. And so unless we set this goal, how are we all going to pursue it? Same, same element with our supply chain lead. With our head of marketing, we talked about our, um, with our head of marketing and our head of people, we talked about, well, you know, this is what our customers are looking for. This is what our team members are looking for. This is how you demonstrate that you are really serious about this work. And so we wore different hats with different audiences to get them to understand, well, this is what this even is. And then this is why this is important. I remember actually having one conversation with someone. He said, but also it's the right thing to do, right? I was like, oh, yes, yes. Also the right thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. so sometimes the reason is just because it's the right thing yeah. to do. But um, this work, so much of it is really understanding who am I talking to? What's important to them? Where are they? How do I help them get from point A to point B? And when it comes down to it, a lot of it is really similar things that you have to employ when teaching seventh graders yeah. who would rather be somewhere else. But, you know, you're trying to get them excited about the material that you're teaching. Kudos to you. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I don't think I can ever be a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> Patience. Julie, what you're saying there about tailoring your case to different audiences is something I've experienced so much in my career. When we go into a new client and we ask the sustainability team, okay, your top team, what are they worried about right now? What are they losing sleep over? And far too often the sustainability team can't tell you. Like what's actually causing anxiety and or enthusiasm around the business because then we can link sustainability through to that and actually being able to tailor not just to where the company is right now but where individuals within the, within the company is like so you don't have the one generic powerpoint that just goes to everybody with a with a consumer's care business case you're actually answering the needs of your individual internal stakeholders exactly. More work, but it tends to actually work. <laughs> Less work in the end, because otherwise you're pulling your hair out and saying, why won't they listen? Let me do this again. Let me do this again. So we've had an incredible question that's come in online, which I want to go to. And then we'll, then we'll come to the audience because it comes back to something which was, uh, which Anne opened with around empathy and influence. In, as, as a tool for making change. Because again, over this coming week, we're gonna hear a lot about business case, we're gonna hear a lot about the science, we're gonna hear a lot around the logic of why we need to make change. But here at Solutions House, we wanna talk about the human aspects as well. So one of the questions that have come in online is how can empathy and influence work when you're trying to collaborate with partners or even with competitors. So we can see why it works internally in terms of getting stuff done, but actually are you able to bring that into some of your relationships externally as well? Maybe Anne, I'll come to you on that. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it works. You know, we say we have many mouths to feed. We have stakeholders, certainly internally, all cross-functionally, but you know, our, our stakeholder um, universe includes, I do a lot of discussions with investors who want to know what we're doing, NGOs, both friendly and not so friendly, um, you know, uh, the consumer, the customers. So we're a giga guru, so, which means we're contributing to the Walmart gigaton. Um, we are, you know, we have to appeal, and most of, my most important stakeholder actually is our employees, I think, so yes, internally. Um, so I think that how do you employ empathy and influence, you know, getting back to when we first started talking about this panel and, you know, I don't know if you know this, but 
There's a report came out, Ellen Weinreb does a, a biannual report, 60% of the women of, sorry, 60% of the CSOs are women. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying men yeah. can't Woo. be CSOs. I had to <laughs> <laughs> but I do think women tend to be natural born kind of connectors. I mean, yeah. you know, whether it came up from, I have four kids, you have three kids, you know, you don't have to have kids, but they certainly make you connect, that's for sure. But, um, <laughs> And, and we reach, you know, it's in our DNA to reach a broad array of stakeholders. But one of the things I want to emphasize is, you know, we were going to talk a little bit about mentors. Women need to help women, but I think it's so important to also find your, your male allies. Mm -hmm. I mean, men are terrific allies. Most, most of my sponsors, in fact, if not all my sponsors that got me to where I am today were men at Colgate. So... So, you know, I think men also have these characteristics, but women are natural born connectors, like I said, and I think we employ that externally as well as internally. And that making connection, that making human connection, um, is something which, again, we're all here at Climate Week and online to do. So I think that that sort of, again, wonderful friend of mine wrote a book called Only Connect, which is all about trying to make that connection. I can see Julia is, is I'm jumping I'm excited to answer, answer this one. So um, what comes to mind for me when you pose your question is our relationship with our nonprofit partners. I have the benefit of having worked in the nonprofit space for so much of my career. And so for me, that gives me unique insight into what are our nonprofit partners thinking about and trying to do? And what are some of the challenges they face? And what are some of the opportunities that we can leverage when we work together with them? And historically, uh, there's been a fundamental power imbalance. When someone is giving money to someone else, uh, the person giving the money has so much power. The person receiving the money, not so much power because they need that money to do their core work. And so one of the things that my team and I have been really focused on as we've been uh, uh, forging and then uh, bringing to life these partnerships uh, is, is really the principles around how we partner, understanding that that's uh, very, very important and not something to be taken lightly. And so we follow a lot of principles around trust-based philanthropy, which for those of you who aren't familiar, um, focuses on ensuring, you know, or for us, at least the way we think about it is, you know, what are we trying to accomplish? What is our partner trying to accomplish? For Peloton, we have a particular um, presence and we believe that uh, be creating a really welcoming environment for our members, for our customers, is core to how we are successful. And so our aspiration is that everybody of all identities can see themselves in our community, in our ecosystem. And so when they take a Peloton class, they can um, feel comfortable, feel welcome, believe that this is for them. And one of the ways that we believe that you can create that kind of environment is by, by having different types of programming that, that um, celebrates different identities. And so we do that often in partnership with our nonprofit partners. And so that to us is one of the ways that we create value for our, um, for our customers, right? We show them this is how this is a space for you and, and we work with our partners to do that. And, and we are very clear with ourselves about you know, what, what's the value that we're getting from this? And we think about, well, what's the value that our partner is getting from this? And it's, it's financial, right? But there is also a lot more. There is the way in which we can um, uh, celebrate their work and make sure that people know about it. Our instructors have a strong social media presence, so they talk about the work. We might highlight it in the press or whatnot. And so that's one of the ways we, you know, whatever, we donate things, we uh, have events. But the point is, is like, we wanna make sure they're getting value just as we are getting value. We wanna make sure they're getting value in a way that they can count on over time. Our partnerships are longstanding partnerships. We spend a lot of time asking our partners, how are we supporting you? What else do you need? A lot of our grant making is in response to the, to the requests that our partners have made. So it's not so much us assuming, oh, they need this, let's give it to them, but rather saying, hey, what do you need? Okay, well, let's, let's uh, you need some physical space? Okay, come work in our office. Or you need, you know, workout 
maps will give you that. So really responding to the things that they're looking for. And so to your question about empathy and respect, I think uh, one of the places where empathy and respect is really important in partnerships is coming to the table with humility as the grantor and understanding that you know this is a mutually beneficial relationship. And so let's make sure we're asking ourselves, are we creating the benefit we seek to create? Is this relationship working for our partner in the way that we want it to work for them? How do we know and how do we ensure that persists over time? I'm beginning to feel that empathy, respect and connection is itself a winning sustainability strategy. Yeah. And perhaps one, as Anne said, that, that it is innate to so many leaders, but perhaps we need to take it out of that innate space and make it something which we train people in, something which we're, we're helping to teach. So, um, Aman, is this something which, like, Walmart is such an enormous organization, just the relationships internally must be so crucial, but you work in comms, so you've got the external relationships as well. Like, how does empathy show up? Like, honestly, empathy is not an issue for her. She gives the best hugs, just saying. <laughs> if ever want a really good hug, Aman is your I one. am a hugger. But, yeah. yes. But how, do, how does empathy show up in your work and your relationships outside of Walmart? Yeah, you know, I was thinking of that as, as I was hearing Anna and Julia talk, and for me, it, like, really manifests itself in how we work with media. That industry needs training in empathy and just taking a step back and just meditating, whatever it takes, <laughs> whatever it takes. You know, just kind of just, a lot of the issues that we're working on require that several click downs to better understand mm -hmm. the vision, the work, why it may not have results in one year, why it may take five years to actually show results. And so what we're starting to do is we're, we're not pitching media anymore, really. We're picking up the phone, we're having conversations, we're doing a lot of lunches, we're inviting them to our office and saying, come meet our team, come meet our executives, we'll make ourselves available. So kind of trying to be more vulnerable ourselves with our people to say, we know you have priorities and pressure, but we need you to take the time to understand the work so that your story is a more rounded out story. Mm -hmm. So I think just similar principles. I think, again, another thing, work in progress because you know, their industry is also struggling in a lot of ways. So how do you work with them on kind of mainstreaming these conversations, but not always from gotcha or we're all gonna die? Yeah. <laughs> How do you work back from that? <laughs> what back to more going to do? That's been my whole career, man. That's it. But the idea of bringing empathy into those relationships where there's sometimes some stress or yeah. challenge, when we almost always default to defensiveness, um, uh, that's, that's, that's a lifelong learning for a lot of us to have to do that. We've got a few minutes to take some questions from the audience. There's a gentleman down here whose hand went straight up. This gentleman, right, sorry, my dear, right here in the middle at the front. Feel free to share who you are and where you're from if you would like to, remembering yeah. that you're on the recording. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Garrett Marino. I'm the leadership coordinator at a science museum called the Wild Center. Um, we're in this really unique position where we can swing above our weight, and we just won Best Science Museums. So we're trying to drive and lead the nation in climate change education. Um, my role as leadership coordinator and something I'm really passionate about is building on ramps for young people and early mm -hmm. professionals to make transformational leadership. And so I'm wondering if you guys have any advice for young people, early professionals. I'm only 23 myself. And advice around how to build good models of transformational leadership so that we can position these students, these young people to become uh, systems level change makers uh, through courageous, uh, compassionate, and strong leadership. That's brilliant. And we've had quite a few questions that are similar online as well. Thank you so much mm -hmm. around um, Gen Z and some of the people coming into the workforce. So maybe I start because I have four Gen Z kids. Ooh. Three still living at home, if that tells you something. But uh, so ranging from 22 to 28. Um, and there's, if you could bottle the passion and the power that these kids have to drive change, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, you know, what I would say t in, in answer to your question is, I think what we need to do is to provide experiences for them 
So I would invite in you know, people who, like us, who've lived and done this and start to build that network, connect, build that connective tissue. Because you know, I watch my kids and they make fun of me because I'm always telling them to network, talk to people, learn from them. Because they haven't had these experiences yet, but they know what they want to do. But I think there's that practical, you know, that practical side of hearing what others have done. I mean, it may sound simple, but not only hearing, but then somehow through your museum, which sounds terrific, giving them, coming up with programming that could somehow give them that experience to interact and, and actually make things happen more than just go on strike. Um, you know, you have to actually do something, build the solution help them to find that, interact with people who can make that happen. So building a program, bring people, you know, call me. I'll, I, I assume well you're in New York. <laughs> I assume you're in New York. I have a lot of passion for young people yeah. and mentoring, but sponsorship is actually providing experiences. I think that's important. Because that's the number one thing that every young person struggles with is to get the experience required to then be able to do the work. So Julia, do you have any advice for, and again, we've had quite a few questions online around young consumers, Gen Z leaders, getting into sustainability. How do people get into this space? Yeah. Um, I, and uh, yeah, I, I have conversations like this with young people as well. Uh, and what I typically say is, I mean, what Anne said, I think is the key. You have to have experiences. You know that with time you learn things and your perspective is different on the other side of it than when you started. And so the only way is through. Um, and I suggest to people that they think about, well, what is it that really fuels them and that they really enjoy? So think about sitting down and doing work in an Excel spreadsheet. Do you feel happy or sad? What about writing a you know, paper in college? I have some dear friends who feel happy doing that and we right. are grateful for them every day. Exactly, exactly. Like, do you, or, or do you like writing a paper? Yes or no. Okay. Do you like being in a PowerPoint? Yes or no. You have to ask yourself these very tactical questions about, okay, you're sitting in a meeting all day long. Is that good? Is that not good? And get to know yourself through this deductive process of what is it that fundamentally brings me energy and joy. And that's what your job, if you can make it so, should look like. You shouldn't hate writing papers and then have a job where you're a journalist. Like, that's not a match, right? <laughs> and so it's a process that you go through over time to, to figure out, okay, yes to this, no to that, like kind of like an eye exam, you know? But um, what is working in sustainability? It's finding your niche, finding your yeah. pocket where you're doing the thing that you are uniquely good at and you like. And if you can find those two things, then I think that you're gonna have the best possible chance of having the most possible impact, which is really what fundamentally drives me to optimize for impact. And the way I think about doing that is marrying what am I good at and what do I like doing? Love it, that's brilliant. That's a great use of a Venn diagram. Aman. I mean, I would agree with all of that. I was just having a conversa conversation with someone last week who asked me a very similar question. She wants to kind of get into sustainability, has a comms background. And I, I mean, I think when I started out in this field, learning from powerhouses like Anne and so many others who've been doing this for decades, they used to tell me, just get in, learn, connect the dots, and embed. And I think that is still very much true today. Mm -hmm. Get into, be more purposeful about the organization you want to join. Because that culture will either keep you or kick you out. Yeah. So I would say invest in looking at where you want to be. Put that as a priority. Take the role that fits your skills. Then start to make the inroads on sustainability. Yeah. I think that's the best way in. I love and, it. And find people like Anne is for me, and it sounds like for you too, who you can call up and say, you know, hey, I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about that, who are gonna push you. Anne's always like, okay, well, are you a part of this group? And are you, okay, Climate Week is coming up. What are you doing? And she's always looking out for me and making sure that I'm thinking critically about, you know, myself, not just my role in my company, but my own development and my own happiness. And so, you know, find those people who are going to push you and advocate for you and make sure that you're sitting on a panel talking at Climate Week. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I will add one final piece of advice, which is chill out. There is 
massive pressure on young people at the moment. There's the 30 under 30 lists. There's all these incredible young people who are out there kind of with millions of followers on Instagram and all the rest of it. The pressure on a young person to feel that they somehow need to become a world leader is huge. You don't. <laughs> it's like that's being in your 20s is a time to experiment, to fail, to screw up, to find another way, to try out, to try something and decide you don't like it and to go and try something else. And there is so much pressure on young people to try to nail the thing that's going to make them impactful and change making really quickly and by doing that you miss out on a whole load of learning that will stand you in good stead when you are in your 30s 40s and 50s and suddenly have power and influence and choices you can but make. less patience and, and 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 a bit less patience so yeah so, so so cut yourself some slack when you're in your when you're in your 20s about the speed at which you feel that you have to go out we are almost at time, which really sucks because we've got more questions, but hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for networking afterwards. So I'm going to ask us to go down the line at some speed and just say one word about what's next. Where, where are you going next? We've, we've done quite a lot of reflecting about where we've come from and where we started and what our journeys were towards um, winning strategies. What are you and your team going to be doing next? Um, so I think um, a space that, you know, we're a consumer goods company. Um, we're a big supplier for Walmart, um, and I love that we're all somehow connected to living better or health. That's a common thread across all of us, um, and that's important for the consumer. And we haven't tapped into the consumer yet, mm -hmm. um, and we need to. We we being the biggest toothpaste provider in the world, we have an opportunity to educate consumers. We can reach consumers. Walmart can certainly reach consumers. So that's a big next step for us. And that's huge. There's an intimacy to brands. You're in our homes, in our bathrooms, our bodies. Mm -hmm. There's an ability there to connect with people that perhaps others don't have. I think that's such a great next step. Very excited to see what comes from that. Julia, where next? We're continuing to think about just how do we ensure that the work that my team is holding is really thoughtfully integrated with what is driving business value. I believe that we are positioned to be most effective when we are understanding how that which we're doing is also syncing with what the business is after and together. Um, affecting the type of change that we believe needs to be affected. So focus on business value. Business value, which again is 20 years, 30 years later, we still need to constantly make that case. Uh, I would echo both of that and go back to where Anne started early on, focus. There is so much that needs to be done and there's so many distractions. Focus, get the 50, 70% right versus going after the 100% perfectly. I think that's gonna be the focus. Love it. That's absolutely spot on. And we're spot on time as well. Yeah. Trust a group of women to be dulled on time. So um, <laughs> I would like to thank Anne Tracy um, from Colgate Palmolive and particularly thank Colgate Palmolive for allowing a conversation like this to happen during Climate Week. I'd like to thank um, Julia Matthews from um, ESG and Peloton, particularly for helping move my health. And I'd like to thank um, uh, Aman Singh and all the incredible work that Aman has being done and will continue to do. And I think we get, loads of people have asked whether we can get Tagada on stage. Tagada! No, she's just going to ignore me completely. Those of you who are in the front row, for those at home, she's here. We promise we'll show her later on. Please join me in giving them a big round of thanks.